you're on. Okay. Well, we have a good group tonight, and uh, we're going to look at the Feast of the Booths, um, Sukkot. And uh, this is the last of the redemptive free feasts that we're going to study from chapter 23 of the book of Leviticus. Um, as a review of last week, in our last study, we looked at the Feast of Pentecost, and we looked at it from the threefold perspective on what it meant to the Israelites in the Old Testament, what it meant to the early church, and what it means to us today as believers. And we said that although Pentecost was a day set aside to offer thanks to God for the wheat harvest, it was also called the Feast of the First Fruits. It, um, Later in Jewish history, it was recognized as the time when God gave the Israelites the law at the foot of Mount Sinai, and when Israel became a nation, and under God's, as part of God's covenant people. Now, during the celebration of Pentecost, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we learned that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the apostles, and then on 3,000 believers who listened to and believed Peter's sermon and his eyewitness testimony about the resurrection of Christ. And um, Christian scholars today recognize the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as really the birth of the church. We concluded our lesson with the understanding that the day of Pentecost in terms of the time when God gave the Israelites the law and later when God poured out the Holy Spirit on the believers as enabling the believer today to grow in sanctification by obedience to the law and to worship the Lord in both spirit and truth, truth being the Bible itself and the truth that's revealed by God in the Bible. Now, this week, we're going to look at the last, as I said before, the seven redemptive feasts, which God required the Israelites to celebrate. And throughout the discussion of these feasts, the word in their appointed time. Uh, these were appointments between God's covenant people, the Israelites and the God. And three of these were pilgrimage uh, festivals where the men were required to journey to Jerusalem to celebrate and worship the Lord. Now the Feast of the Tabernacles looked forward to and anticipated the future reign of the Messiah as king over all the nations, and it also looked forward to the complete restoration of Israel in the promised land. And so this is something that's really important to understand because at the time that Jesus ministered on earth, the main thought, the main idea that the people were thinking about is the Messiah. And they believed that the Messiah's coming to earth was eminent. And if you remember, Jesus uh, conducted his ministry when the nation of Israel was under the authority of Rome. And it was governed by the Sanhedrin, the high priests that uh, in some cases, even they, they weren't even Jews. Some of them were uh, Elamites and other uh, different uh, people than the Jews. The main message I want you to get from tonight's lesson is that Culminating the seven redemptive feasts celebrated by the Israelites, the Feast of the Tabernacles symbolized and pointed towards the prophesied future reign of the Messiah over the restored nation of Israel and over all the other nations of the world. And this was in an earthly kingdom. The Israelites prayed for the Messiah to come and Christians today and then look forward to Jesus as the Messiah to return to establish his earthly kingdom. The Israelites didn't recognize the, Jesus as the Messiah, and so they're awaiting the coming of the Messiah. But Christians who accepted Jesus Christ in his first advent as the Son of God were waiting for the return of the Messiah. So in outline, we're going to have an overview of what the Feast of the Tabernacles was all about, the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' time, the future messianic fulfillment of the Feast of the Tabernacles, then we'll have in our formal format, the discussion questions and the concluding remarks. Now, as an overview to the Feast of the Tabernacles, well, what is it? It's, as I mentioned before, it's the last of God's seven redemptive feasts that the Israelites were required to celebrate. 
when I say redemptive feasts, what I'm talking about is each of these feasts, as we've studied them, had something to do with God's plan of redemption. They pointed towards the nation of Israel, but they also, to a wider audience, the church and the Gentiles that, uh, that came and believed in Jesus Christ as the son of God. Now, it's important, I think, in, to put the Feast of the Tabernacles in perspective, to have a quick review of the redemptive aspects of these seven feasts. The first one, if you remember, was Passover, which is celebrated on the 14th day of Nisan, uh, which is really the first day of the Jewish calendar. If you remember, when Passover took place, God in the month of Isan established a new cal calendar for the Israelites. And it was that first month on the 14th day that they slaughtered the lamb and spread the blood of the lamb over the doorposts. And this commemorates Israel's redemption from the bondage in Egypt when the angel of God passed over the households where the blood of the slaughtered lamb was spread over the door frames. And Passover from the redemptive standpoint also pointed towards Jesus as being the lamb of God. Now the feast of the unleavened bread started the day immediately following, following Passover. And it's a, it was a seven day feast, which started on the 15th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar. And it commemorates the haste in which Israel was required to leave Egypt. Pharaoh, basically, after the death of all these Egyptian firstborn, um, basically said, get out of here. And so Israel, in a rush, packed up their things and started to head out of, uh, their, out of Egypt, heading towards the promised land. And so the bread was unleavened or it, they didn't have time to put the leaven in it to rise. But leaven also represents sin. And so it really talked about Israel being called out by God as God's holy people, people without sin. But in the redemptive aspect to the Christian, it points to Jesus being the bread of life without sin. Now, the Feast of the First Fruits was celebrated again during this seven day period of the celebration of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It's, it, it took place the morning after the first Sabbath after Passover, and it celebrated the first harvest of barley and commemorates Israel being the first fruit of God's redemptive plan. He called out Israel to be his holy people. That was just one part of the progressive revelation of his redemptive plan. It points in a redemptive aspect, the Feast of the First Fruits pointed towards Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus as the firstborn of God's redeemed. And if you recall, the, uh, that year that Jesus was crucified and was resurrected, that first fruits was celebrated on a Sunday and that's when Jesus was resurrected. So it points to his resurrection as a bodily re resurrection as a firstborn of what we will have in, fu in our future. Now, the next one, these, these three feasts were all feasts during the first month of the Jewish calendar. Then 50 days later, the Jews were required to celebrate Pentecost. And I already reviewed that that's when um, they celebrated the first harvest of the wheat. And it commemorates the giving of the law at Mount Sinai and the birth of the nation of Israel. In a redemptive aspect to believers, Pentecost commemorates the outpouring of the Holy Spirit spirit and the birth of the church now the last three redemptive feasts which take place in the seventh month the month of teshrai of the jewish calendar they consisted of the feast of the trumpets and if you recall that feast included 10 days where the jewish people examined themselves and repented of their sins uh, leading to the last day of the Feast of the Trumpets, which was Yom Kippur, which is celebrated on the 10th day. During the Feast of Trumpets, Israel is called out to repentance. However, to the believers today, it really represents the trumpet call of the church and the rapture of the believers. Then the next day or the final day of the Feast of the Trumpets was the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. And it was the day when the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies and presented before God the sacrifices of atonement for the entire nation of Israel. 
redemptively, it points towards Jesus as the once and for all acceptable sacrifice in atonement for sin. And Jesus becoming our eternal high priest. He was ascended and sits at the right hand of God on the throne. So tonight we're going to look at the final feast and you can see that how each of them progressively talks about God's redemptive plan. And so we call these the redemptive feasts. The Feast of the Tabernacles or Sukkot commemorates God's provision and shelter of Israel in the wilderness and looks forward to the future reign of the Messiah over all the nations in an earthly kingdom. The Jewish people did not consider Jesus as the Messiah. However, believers today associate the Feast of the Tabernacles with the second coming of Christ to rule over his millennial kingdom. It comes together, the final redemptive plan. Now the Feast of the Tabernacles is one of the three pilgrimage feasts where God required the men of Israel to journey to Jerusalem to celebrate and worship. But it points to the end time harvest, just like the fall was the end time harvest of all the crops of Israel uh, in the promised land. It, but this was a harvest of believers, both Jewish and Gentile from all the nations. And this is when the Messiah will establish and reign over his earthly kingdom as king over all the nations of the world and he'll rule from Jerusalem. Now, this feast has a number of different names and each of them adds an aspect to understanding what this feast was all about. The first one is Sukkot. Sukkot is the plural of the Hebrew word sukkah, which translates as dwelling or covering. In other places in the Hebrew scriptures, sukkah describes, remember when Moses asked if he could see God, see the face of God, and God said, well, Moses, you stay in the cleft of the rock and I will pass by you. Well, the word sukkah is the covering of God's hand over Moses as he passed by him. And then Moses only seeing his, his, the back of, of the Lord. Um, it also is a word that was used to describe the covering of cloud during the day and the cloud of fire at night that covered and sheltered the Israelites in the wilderness. So this word has an aspect of covering this feast is also called the Feast of the Tabernacles. Tabernacle is the English translation for a temporary dwelling or tent. It was a name that was given to the structure built by the Israelites where God dwelt with the Israelites in the wilderness, the tabernacle and the tent of the meeting. And so that it becomes a dwelling place or God dwelling with Israel. And it also describes the tents that the Israelites lived in when they lived in the wilderness. The ne another name for this feast is the Feast of Booths or Shelters. The word booths and shelters describe the rudimentary tents which the Israelites built to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Today, and this is where we're going to have Terry used a PowerPoint presentation to show pictures or depict pictures of booths that Jewish people make today. They're ad hoc and they're makeshift uh, type of, of uh, shelters. And I wanted to show you these pictures to give you a number of examples of what, what these shelters look like. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's see what happened. Well, shoot, machine. There it is. Okay. Bob, okay. the first pictures are the Talmud pictures. Yes, I got a question from a couple of you about what the Talmud is. And it's a it's a series of books that were written to expand upon the law, the Levitical laws and the practices for these different feasts. Um, there's uh, two different sets of the Talmud, and this is a, a set of the Babylonian Talmud. Um, and you can see it's a number of books. and they really just describe these festivals. And this is the Jewish uh, Talmud, which is different from the Babylonian. They're in smaller bounded volumes, but you can see the whole set of them there. And so in detail, the Jews through the Talmud uh, added to their Jewish law and their, how they practice their festivals and worship. Okay. Now the next picture. This is an example of one of the booths and you can see 
the and it had a tent covering on the top and then you can see the people seated to eat underneath the tent now this is an example of uh, a booth where you can see the family sitting to eat and above them you can see all the branches that cover them and these branches were not supposed to cover or shelter them from being able to see the stars at night because they were going to look at the heavens and they're petitioning God for the Messiah to come. And this is another example of a rudimentary uh, uh, booth that's made in the backyard and it's made all of branches. The whole thing is branches. And there's a table in the inside there. This is another example where, again, the palm branches are covering the top, and then you have kind of a veranda coverings on the side with a picnic table in the middle. This is another example, um, kind of combining the branches plus the coverings, and again, the table in the middle. That's it. Okay, so I thought this would give you kind of an example of these booths. Uh, when this feast was celebrated in the time of Jesus, they all the people would make these booths and not only did they stay in them for the entire feast of the booths but they also um ate in them and uh this was the there were booths all over jerusalem because this was a large festival where uh and a pilgrimage festival where a lot of people came to jerusalem to celebrate the joy of the winter uh, of the fall harvest and ask and petition the Lord for the Messiah to come. Now, the next description of this feast is called the Feast of the Ingathering. And the reference to ingathering refers to the Israelites coming together and assembling to celebrate this eight day feast. It also references the future gathering of Israel and all the nations under the earthly reign of the Messiah during the millennium. The final name that's given in scripture for this feast is the Feast of Rejoicing. Since this feast was celebrated in the autumn during the fall harvest, all the grain and fruit and vegetable crops were being harvested. And it was a time of celebration because it was a time of bounty. And this is when, just like we have our harvest festivals, you celebrate the harvest. The reference to rejoicing also points to the time when Israel will be gathered together in the promised land under the earthly reign of the Messiah over all the nations of the earth, when there will be great rejoicing because Israel will be restored as a nation and it will have preeminence all over all the other nations. Now, there are some significant historical events that took place during the Feast of Booths in Jewish history. Solomon's Temple was dedicated during the Feast of Booths. Hezekiah, if you remember in the Southern Kingdom, there were times of apostasy where the Jewish people worship Baal and some other gods that and abandoned God as their, the, their Lord and the one that worship. Well, Hezekiah was one of the good kings of the Southern Kingdom. And he called for the Israelites in the Southern Kingdom to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and to restore the worship of the one true God and tear down the asterisk poles and the other um, hilltop uh, places where they worship foreign gods. Then another time was after the exiles returned from returned to Jerusalem from the various parts of the, the uh, Persian Empire under the decree of Cyrus the Great, Ezra proclaimed and read the word of God to the remnant during the celebration of the Feast of Booths. And this is before the second temple was rebuilt, but this is when the law was read to the people and they celebrated this. Now, another interesting thing, and I never thought of it this way until I read the literature about this feast. There are many scholars that believe that Jesus was born not in December in the winter months, but during the Feast of Booths. And John, they get this from reading the first part of John, the Gospel of John, where the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then John said that God dwelt with us. And dwelt being a word of art associated with the Feast of Booths, there's a thought that Jesus was born during the Feast of Booths. This would be confirmed by the practices of shepherds who did not tend their sheep in the winter months in the fields. Usually the sheep were brought in. 
And so if the angels were announcing to the shepherds, then they had to be in the fields because that's what the scriptures say. And that would probably be in the autumn months before they took the sheep into the, um, into the enclosures. Also, it's consistent with what the Feast of Booths is all about. The first coming of Jesus Christ or the Messiah during the Feast of Booths, and then the second coming of Christ or the advent at the time uh, the millennial kingdom and his reign starts. So there's a good amount of literature more than I ever thought of about the Jesus being born during the Feast of Booths, which is in the fall, as opposed to being born in the winter. The final thing that I, does it for me is in about the uh, fourth century AD, they just arbitrarily picked December 25th because that was a feast when other pagan religions celebrated mm -hmm. things. And so it's really tied into more of a pagan worship than it is to the actual date that Jesus was born. Nobody knows for sure the date, the exact month that Jesus was born or the day, but it, I, it certainly makes sense to me that it would be during the Feast of Booths. Now there are two major scriptural references to the Feast of Booths. One of them is Leviticus chapters 23, verses 33 through 36 and 39 through 43. And then the other is Numbers 29, verses 12 through 35. Now this is a feast where again, God in chapter 23 is instructing Moses to teach the Israeli people about these redemptive feasts. And I'm gonna read most of the Leviticus chapter, but I'll just summarize the numbers one. Starting with the verse 33, the Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites the feast of booths to the Lord begins on the 15th day of the seventh month and continues for seven days. There is to be a sacred assembly on the first day. You are not to do any daily work. You are to present a fire offering to the Lord for seven days. On the eighth day assembly, present a fire offering to the Lord. It is a solemn gathering. You are not to do any daily work. You are to celebrate the Lord's festival on the 15th day of the seventh month for seven days after you have gathered the produce of the land. There will be a complete rest on the first day and a complete rest on the eighth day. On the first day, you are to take the product of majestic trees, palm fronds, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord seven days each year. This is a permanent statute for you throughout your generations. You must celebrate it in seventh month. You are to live in booths for seven days. All the native born of Israel must live in booths so that your generations may know that I made the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. You can see where these booths were constructed of the branches of these trees and palms are a representative of that. And you also see that this is a statute of the Lord to be celebrated by all generations. And that's why we see Jewish people today, even though they don't have the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, although some are doing that now, um, they celebrate it in their backyards by building one of these makeshift uh, shelters now in Numbers 29 verses 12 through 35, which I'm not going to read the whole part, basically it talks about the sacrifices that are made during the Feast of the Tabernacles. And you will see that from the paragraphs, there are an, a descending number of bulls that are sacrificed, starting with 13 bulls being sacrificed on the first day down to a seven bulls being sacrificed on this seventh day of the this feast. When you add up 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, I've lost your okay am I back? You're back. Am I back yet? Yes. Okay, good. Anyway when you add up all these bulls that are sacrificed over this seven day period, you it adds up to 70. And seven times 10 is always representative of the nations of the world. And so that's the main reason that I included that entire passage there. 
Now let's, let's talk about the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' time. This is an eight-day feast. The first day and the last day were treated as Sabbath days or days of rest where the Israelites could not do any kind of work. The first day of the feast was celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month. And this is, this is celebrated five days after Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. And that was several, celebrated on the 10th day of this month. Now on the first day of the feast, three 75 foot candle stands, really big candle stands were erected in the court of the women in the temple. The next six days, which are referred to as the Chol Hamid or the intermediate days were festival weekdays where some work could be done, but there was also sacrifices, celebrations and ceremonies. The seventh day, which was referred to as the Hosanna Rabbah or the great Hosanna was when Israel petitioned for the Messiah to appear and restore the nation of Israel as an earthly kingdom. So we have seven days, festivals, all these ceremonies, these sacrifices, and then you have the eighth day. The eighth day or Shemini Aseret was a solemn day celebrated as a Sabbath or non-working day, but it was marked by the extinguishment of the candles in the courtyard. They put out the candles. Now we're going to talk about the booths. We've already shown you these, but the Jewish families living in Jerusalem and those that journeyed or pilgrimaged to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast erected temporary dwelling places, which they referred to as booths. These booths were used to shelter the people during the eight day celebration of the feast. And like the booths today, the booths were three sided, temporary uh, makeshift shelters or tents but they were richly decorated, even more than the pictures that showed you there with branches, flowers, and fruits because it was a joyous uh, occasion. It's almost like, even though it was a fall harvest, it's almost like some of the things that we do with flowers to celebrate Easter. The next thing is what they call the waving of the lulav. The scriptures required the Jewish people to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles with four species. This is the word in the scripture, which included branches taken from the palm, myrtle, and willow trees, and citron, which is a lemon shrub, which produces a fruit that's similar to, but much larger, almost the size to a lemon. During the feast, when the Jewish people went up to the temple from their booths, they would walk around the brazen altars, singing and shouting prayers of praise and worship while waving these three species of branches taken from the palm, myrtle, and willow trees. This was the luvav. And they wave, would wave it in all four directions, north, east, south, and west, and which represented the four corners of the world or represented all the nations that were around Israel. And so they waved the luvav of these branches to them. Now, the waving of the lulav represents Israel's Masonic, Messiah's future reign over all the nations, but also the inclusion of all the nations of the world in the, the, this millennial kingdom that is set, established by the Messiah. Now, the next ceremony that was celebrated during this period of time was the water pouring ceremonies. On each of the first six days of the Feast of Booths, a priest followed by a luwa waving crowd would take a golden pitcher from the treasury and draw the water from the pool of Siloam. The priest would then return to the temple followed by the crowds waving their lulav and chanting passages from the book of Isaiah. We will gather water from the wells of salvation and passages from the Hallel Psalms, which are Psalms 113 through 118, shouting Hosanna which translates, save us now. And so you would see this crowd waving these branches and shouting, Hosanna, God save us. And they would be following the priest back up to the courtyard of the women, uh, well, to the brazen altar first. And what they would do is they'd go up to the altar. When the priest got to the altar, for the first six days, he would circle the altar once, and then he would pour out the water from the pitcher. And he would shout that 
asking God to provide the Messiah, which is what they believe only God would provide to the nation of Israel. Now, the seventh day of the feast called the great Hosanna, Hosanna Rabbah, was considered the greatest day of the feast. It's building up to a crescendo. The priests, followed by the praising and worshiping crowds, waving their lulav, would go to the pool of Siloam with a golden pitcher to draw water. When the, pitch, when the priest returned to the temple, he would circle the brazen altar seven times. Each time the priest circled the altar, the shouts of the crowd crying for the provision of God and the salvation of God would grow louder and louder. And then he would pour out the water. It kind of reminds me of how they took the Ark of the Covenant and walked around Jericho once for six days and on the seventh day, seven times. And so it, it's just kind of interesting that there's a parallel there. The next ceremony that was celebrated during the Feast of the Tabernacles was the ceremony of lights. I mentioned that on the first day they erected these 75 foot candle stands and all the people would go up in the evenings and ladders were used for young men to climb up the ladders and light the wicks on these huge candle stands. The wicks were made of the discarded clothing of the priests, which they wrapped around, put oil on them and ignited. And the light would shine so brightly that it was uh, said in um, Josephus that it would light up all the courts of the temple and some of the courts around Jerusalem. Now, as these lights were being lit and as the people were celebrating the light festivals, at the base of the these gigantic candle stands, persons would read from the Talmud. And we saw pictures of what that looked like. One of the descriptions given of this celebration is men of piety and good deeds would dance before them, the candle stands, with lighted torches in their ha hands, singing songs and praises. Levites without number played harps, lyres, cymbals, trumpets, and other musical instruments. Thereupon, the 15 steps leading down from the court of the Gentiles to the court of the women. You could see that this is just a tremendous festival celebration. But on the eighth day of the feast, which is called the Shemini Ezeret, the lights were extinguished. And the day was celebrated as a Sabbath day. And it was a day of solemnity a, with a final petition and appeal for the Messiah to appear and reign as king in order to establish the kingdom of God on earth. You could see that after all the lights, the water pouring, the shouting and everything, it was really a bummer to go on the eighth day because the lights were extinguished, the festival's coming to an end. The other thing is the sacrifice of the 70 bulls. We talked about the number of bulls being sacrificed starting at 13 on the first day, going down to seven on the sixth day. Th these totaled 70, which I already mentioned that um, they represented all the nations of the world being sacrificed. Well, now we know an idea of how in Jesus' time they celebrated this feast. Let's look at the future messianic fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. There's a number of Old Testament prophecies which are important. The celebration of the Feast of Booths looked forward to the time in the future prophesied by Zechariah when the Messiah, sitting upon his glorious throne in Jerusalem, will reign as Israel's king over all the nations of the world. If you remember when we studied the book of Zechariah, the passages that come from Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 21. Then all the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of booths. Should any of the families of earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, rain will not fall on them. And if the people of Egypt will not go up and enter, the rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague the Lord inflicts on the nations who do not go up to celebrate the festival of booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and all nations that do not go up to celebrate. On that day, the words holy to the Lord will be on the bells of the horses. The pots in the house of the Lord will be like sprinkling basins before the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea will be holy to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices will come and take some of the pots to cook in. And on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite 
which is really a reference, there will no longer be sinful people in the, millenn in the rule in Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, this is similar to the prophecy of Ezekiel, who prophesied about the Messiah reigning from Jerusalem as king over the restored kingdom of Israel. In Ezekiel 37, verses 25 through 28, they will live in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They will live in it forever with their children and grandchildren. And my servant David, through Jesus, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish and multiply them and will set my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. When my sanctuary is among them forever, the nations will know that I, Yahweh, sanctify Israel. This is really talking about the restoration of Israel, which was celebrated in the Feast of Booths. The prophet Isaiah also prophesied that the nation of Israel would be restored in righteousness as a light of salvation to the rest of the nations. In Isaiah 42, verse 6, and, verse, and chapter 49, verse 6, it states, I, Yahweh, have called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. I will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. It is not for, enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, I read these passages because I want you to put yourself in the shoes of an Israelite during the time that Jesus ministered on earth. They knew these passages. They studied the Old Testament. And the celebration of the Festival of Booths was, was, was celebrated with the expectation that the return of the, or not the return, the coming of the Messiah was imminent. They expected that the Messiah would come in the years that Jesus ministered. And so, the people universally understood these prophecies and they expected, they anticipated them to be fulfilled in their lifetime. Now, I want to talk a little bit as a diversion about Peter on the mountain of transfiguration. With this mindset about the festival of booze and about the belief at the time that the Messiah was coming, in Matthew 16, 28, Jesus promised that some of his disciples would witness the Messiah coming to reign before they died. It says, Jesus said, I assure you, there are some standing here, he's talking to his disciples, who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus was basically telling Peter, expect the Messiah to appear. Six days later, he takes Peter, James, and John up onto a high mountain where he's transfigured before them into his glorified body knowing the prophecies relating to the fulfillment of israel's hopes for the messiah to appear and what jesus had just told him and to reign over the kingdoms of the nations peter wanted to erect booths because he was expecting the lord to stay as a messiah he, it was revealed to him and so it wasn't quite the foolish act that you, we sometimes as christians when we study to say oh peter was just being presumptuous no peter understood the prophecy and these booze were a me means of saying the messiah is here because it's a festival of, of booze so knowing the prophecies relating to the fulfillment of israel's hopes for the messiah to appear and reign as king over all the nations peter erected these booze now we're going to go to jesus toward the end of the celebration of the feast of tabernacles on the seventh day jesus revealed that he was the Messiah. If you recall in the script that he's basically the Messiah. And he's talking about, even though they're pouring out of water, he's referring to the Spirit. And John had to clarify that in his scriptures. Now let's talk about the next day, the day when the lights were extinguished. On the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, after the candles had been extinguished at the treasury in the court of the women near the great but extinguished candles, Jesus spoke to the people whose hopes had been dimmed and were lamenting because the Messiah had not yet appeared to fulfill their hopes. Jesus said to them at that time, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, 
but will have the light of life. So here in the Feast of Booze, Jesus is proclaiming that he's the Messiah. So we final, we conclude this lesson with the book of Revelations, which confirms the millennial and end time fulfillment of the hopes of the Israelites symbolized by the Feast of the Tabernacles. In Revelation 7, verses 9 through 10 and verse, and verse 15, a crowd of people from all the nations will assemble before the throne of God and the Lamb. The scriptures say, starting with verse 9, after this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who is seated on the throne and to the lamb for this reason they are before the throne of god and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary the one seated on the throne will shelter them ultimately at the very end of time after the millennial reign jesus will reign forever over a new heaven and earth in revelations 21 verses 1 through 3 the scriptures say then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. And I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God is dwelling, tabernacled with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So what you have is Old Testament prophecies. You have this anticipation of the coming of the Messiah during the ministry of Jesus. We have Jesus himself on the final two days of the celebration of the festival of booze, indicating that he is, will pour out living water, the Holy Spirit. And we have him announcing the next day that he's the light of the world, um, announcing to the people he's the Messiah. So the festival of booze has significance. It has a lot of significance to the Israelites who believe that the Messiah will eventually come, restore the nation of Israel and reign as a king on earth. Now to the Christians, the believers, they believe that Jesus will return. He's the Messiah, but he'll return and he'll reign on earth in a millennial kingdom. So this is where God's redemptive plan is all put together in the final feast of the tabernacles. So that concludes the study part. We're going to get to the questions that Paul always likes to enjoy. The coming and reign of their Messiah and the future age, which is Alam Haba, which will take place when the Messiah, Messiah actually comes. Jewish people are time oriented. The present age, the future age. And that's how they think of things. And the Jewish people today are anticipating the coming of the Messiah. Some are even thinking about rebuilding the temple to bring about the coming of the Messiah. Now, the Feast of the Tabernacles and the activities which took place during the eighth day festival were focused around the hope for the imminent fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies by the revelation and arrival of the Messiah to restore Israel and to reign over all the nations of the earth which leads to the thought that I want to leave you with today. And that is, as believers, should we share the same hope for the imminent return of Christ to reign as king over all the nations of the earth? Do we live, do we live in, do you live our lives today in anticipation that maybe tomorrow Jesus could return? I don't think we have the same imminent belief that the Jewish people had when Jesus was ministering on earth, but maybe we should. So I leave you with that thought. Amen. Good thought. Very good, Bob.